Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 44, The Lady on the $20 Note. Despite looking at this $20 note for many, many years, I didn't know the history behind the lady that's on that note, Mary Reby. So this is her story. Mary Reby was born on the 12th of May, 1777, in Bury, Lancashire, England. She was christened Molly Haydock. Her parents were of respectable status, James Haydock and Jane Law. However, she was orphaned at four years old and was brought up by her maternal grandmother. Mary was well educated at Blackburn Grammar School and attended church regularly. And on the death of her grandmother in 1790, when she was only 13, she left Lancashire. While working as a house servant, she disguised herself as a boy and stole a horse from John Sorton. The court records state that Mary was prevailed on by another young girl, who isn't named, to give up her job in June 1791, and in order that neither were discovered, to dress as boys and change their names. Mary took on the name of James Burrow after a boy she knew who had recently died. It wasn't until she was under trial in the court sessions, convicted of horse stealing at Stafford on the 21st of July 1790, under the names of Giles Burrow, was her identity disclosed. The prisoner had claimed that the horse belonged to her uncle, John Burrow, a grocer at Darbin near Chester. At another point in the reports, Darbin is given as the uncle's name. The judge considered the prisoner to be artful and the crime not likely to be her first offence. So in other words, he could see right through her lie. Horse stealing was punishable by death in the late 18th century. Mary was spared due to a petition for merciful release and due to her tender age. The petition was drawn up in Blackburn, and heading this was Adam Hope, who was her cousin. He was a woolen draper, and he was aided with a collective petition of 19 people. And this was presented to Justice Heath. Justice Heath reports to His Majesty in a very restrained manner, and he writes, I report the case of a person who was tried before me at the summer assizes for stealing a bay mare, which person then answered by the name of James Burrow, but is a girl of the name of Mary Haydock. If there were any respectable persons who would take charge of her and enter into the cognizance that she shall not commit any felonies for four or five years to come, she might justly be entitled to the royal mercy. Otherwise, I am humbly of the opinion, it is more advantageous for the prisoner herself and expedient for the public example that she should be transported. So, as a result, no one took charge of Mary and she was, in fact, transported. So, the grounds for clemency was her youth. She was an orphan. She was of good education from a respectable family, had been brought up in a religious environment by her recently deceased grandmother. She did not steal the mare, but it had been given to her by an evil-minded person. So, the initial sentence was death and then it was commuted to seven years' transportation she departed England, bound for New South Wales on the 30th of May, 1792. She arrived in Sydney on the Royal Admiral on the 7th of October, 1792, and was assigned as a nursemaid in the household of Major Francis Gross. On arrival, she wrote to her aunt, Penelope Hope, expressing her ambition to reduce her sentence of seven years and to watch every opportunity to get away in two or three years, but I will make myself as happy as I can in my present and unhappy situation. So instead of returning two to three years later as she'd planned, at the age of 17, on the 7th of September 1794 in Sydney, she married Thomas Reby after he proposed to her several times. He was an Irishman, formerly of the East India Company, and it would be a fortuitous marriage for both of them, and together they made a very solid, loyal working partnership. In 1792, Thomas Raby, but later became Raby, 
was aged 20 and was a junior officer for Captain Raven of the Britannia, which was anchored in the harbour when Mary's ship, the Royal Admiral, arrived. And maybe this is how Mary met Thomas. Thomas was eight years older than Mary and appears to have been the first free settler outside the military ring to trade. The first years of his married life were spent on the Hawkesbury River, where he was granted land and was engaged in a grain-carrying business from the Hawkesbury to Sydney. He acquired several more farms on the Hawkesbury and traded in coal, cedar, furs and skins. The scope of his business activity was indicated when in 1801 he became indebted to Robert Campbell Sr. for the sum of £160 and 10 shillings and in October 1803 he mortgaged to Campbell three Hawkesbury farms totalling 260 acres, their buildings, crops, livestock and boats along with certain other property and buildings in Sydney for a further credit advance of £150 to enable him to carry on his business. By 1803, he also owned three small boats, the James, Edwin and Raven, and he also traded to the Hunter River with the coal, cedar and wheat. In 1804, Thomas and Mary moved to Sydney, where they opened a general store at the Rocks. Mary looked after the store and her husband applied himself chiefly to selling timber and running the coastal trade with two sloops. In September 1805, Thomas Reby and Edward Wills began a partnership engaging in the seal trade for both oil and fur. In February 1806, the Gazette reported that the hull of a vessel being built for Reby and Wills was almost finished. It was quite a large vessel for the time and the ship was christened Mary and Sally, after Mary, his wife, and Edward's daughter, Sally. And this vessel is listed on Sarah Wills' later marriage agreement document when she married George Howe. And this is covered in the bonus episode number eight on Edward Wills, related to episode 36, The Printer. In 1807, the pair bought the schooner Mercury for trade in the Pacific Islands. Their trading activities were extended to the Bass Strait and from 1809 to China and India. In 1807, Thomas and Mary were able to leave their rather disreputable rocks establishment and build a substantial stone residence on a further land grant that they were given near the waterside in what is now Macquarie Place. Thomas turned his former association with the East India Company to advantage by importing general merchandise. He named his trading establishment Intelli House after a suburb in Calcutta. One of Mary Reby's strong points was her ability to keep on good terms with all the governors, each of whom had a good word for her. She even avoided friction during the Bly Mutiny and in 1809 eased Thomas of much voyaging by persuading Colonel Patterson to make him an official Port Jackson pilot. He was appointed in March 1809, but in October 1809, being a restless soul, he undertook what he probably considered his last voyage to China and India on the Lady Barlow. It was financially necessary because he had losses suffered in New South Wales. In Calcutta, he was stricken with sunstroke. He returned on the Mary and Sally in late 1810, but did not fully recover from its effects, and he died at Intelli House on the 5th of April 1811. On the death of her husband and his partner Edward Wills a month later, Mary Reby was left with seven children and virtually entire control of the numerous business concerns. As a wealthy widow in her early 30s, she was a very eligible woman. However, Mary did not marry again, unlike Edward's wife Sarah, who went on to marry George Howe. Rather, she managed both her children and business interests with admirable acumen and extended and consolidated the Reby family empire. She was a hotel keeper, one of the very few people Macquarie allowed to retail spirits, and had another store that traded in salted pork and flour. She already had experience in assisting her husband and managing his interests when he was absent on voyages. She soon became very prosperous and an entrepreneurial member of the group trained in a tough school of competition with the American, Chinese and Indian traders. Unlike many of her contemporaries, she was not litigious, but proved capable of conducting her business affairs with the utmost vigour. Perhaps she preferred her own more direct methods to enforce payments of debts, for in May 1817 she was found guilty of an assault upon one of her debtors, John Walker of Windsor. Lachlan Macquarie liked her so well that he asked her for advice on the advantages of early colonial manufacturers. A vague phrase, but obviously indicating her value as a businesswoman. 
She owned, besides the inn and the house she lived in, a third house on the shores of Darling Harbour, seven farms on the Hawkesbury and a grant of good farmland at Aird's near Appen. In the eyes of her contemporaries, Mary Reby gradually rose to respectability and affluence in a new emancipist society. She opened a new warehouse in George Street in 1812 and purchased more trading vessels that saw her extend her shipping and trading interests further. She secured land grants in Van Diemen's Land for her two eldest sons and began to trade extensively with interests there. By 1817, the year she turned 40, Mary Reby was estimated to be worth £20,000, the equivalent of around $3.5 million today. Three years later, she owned property and land totalling 1,000 acres. She continued to manage her husband's ships and extended her operations by buying the John Palmer and, in 1817, the Brig Governor Macquarie. In 1817, she was appointed a founding member of the Bank of New South Wales. The bank, in fact, was founded in her house at Macquarie Place and it later was converted as the main office of the bank. This property was demolished in 1880. There is a letter from Mary Reby to her cousin Alice and it tells of the arrival of Mary's sister Elizabeth Haydock Foster and her sister's children in Sydney in 1818. August the 12th, 1818. Dear Cousin Alice, I avail myself of the opportunity of letting you know that with myself, my family are all well, and that of announcing the safe arrival of my dear sister and her family, they are all well except herself which suffered severely during the passage of five months and two days, but now thank God she is perfectly recovered, and which added more to her disappointment was when she arrived, I was absent at Van Diemen's Land, where I had gone to settle my affairs previous to my coming home. George is now at Van Diemen's Land as I left him to collect the remainder of my debts and rents when I heard my sister had arrived. I was very impatient to see her. She has not seen him yet. I went down there in a brig of my own commanded by my son Thomas. No one will do well that is not a thrifty, correct and sober person in this place. It is not like England where you are under the eye of everyone and your character scrutinised by rich and poor. Although you may have a different opinion of it, Though the different characters that come here, but they are kept well in order by our good governor, Lachlan Macquarie. Those houses in Selford, which did belong to me and my sister, and which she has made over her interest into your mother, I should wish, if agreeable, to repurchase on my arrival in England. The bill is against me. I can assure you my poor sister never mentions your mother, but with tears and the deepest sorrow for her loss. And although I have not seen her for 27 years, it had a great effect on me, for almost the first interchange of words with my sister was to know if my Aunt Hope was alive. I do assure you the meeting of her was one of the happiest moments of my life. Little Eliza and James go to the same school as my three children, who are boarders. They are fine company for each other and are very fond of each other. Little Eliza is such an agreeable little thing. My youngest little girl and her are very much alike and is remarked almost by everyone. I hope, dear cousin, although unknown to you, but for the sake of your dear mother, you will write by every opportunity and by sending your letters to Mrs Smith in London. Where my sister stayed, she will be remitted. I have nothing more at present to say except my sons and all my children desire their love to you and her respectful compliments to my aunts, Hind and Ramsbottom, and to all inquiring friends, and pray remember me to them likewise. And my sincere love to yourself, I am dear cousin yours affectionately, M. Reby. In March 1820, Mary took her daughters, Celia and Eliza, on a year-long sojourn to England on the Admiral Cockburn. In Lancashire, amid the scenes of her childhood, she was received with interest and admiration. In her private journal, she kept during the visit, She avoids any reference to her conviction and transportation, even when she records returning to her grandmother's house. Her journal relates that it is impossible to describe the sensation I felt on entering my once grandmother's house where I'd been brought up, to find it nearly the same as when I left nearly 29 years ago, all the same furniture, most of them standing in the same place as when I left, but no one I knew or knew me. She notes that she went to church at Bury, where she found the record of her birth and says, for the first time I actually knew exactly how old I was. During this stay they visited London, Manchester, Mary's hometown of Blackburn, Liverpool, Glasgow and Edinburgh. 
they went on a whirlwind of socialising, shopping and visiting old friends and acquaintances. They often went to the theatre and attended many society balls and parties. It seems that Mary and her daughters were partial to elaborate dinners, drinking wine and a hand or two of whist in the evenings. She also conducted business whilst in England and met up with another successful Sydney cider, William Charles Wentworth, who was in England at the time. Returning to New South Wales in 1821, her affairs continued to flourish. She made extensive investments in city property, such as buildings in George Street, Macquarie Place and in the Rocks. By 1828, she had erected many elegant and substantial buildings in Macquarie Place, near the King's Wharf and in the centre of George Street, and was turning her attention to Castlereagh Street. Mary also became increasingly known for her support of charity, religion and education. She had a lifelong interest in education, and in 1825, she was appointed a trustee of the Sydney Free Public Grammar School. Later, Bishop William Grant Broughton, commended her exertions in the cause of religion generally and that of the Church of England in particular. She took trouble in hiding her convict status. In the 1828 census, she took advantage of her trip to England. When it was asked to describe her condition, she declared that she came free in 1821, referring to the return voyage from England. She gradually retired from active business and living on her investments. Reby built a cottage in the suburb of Hunters Hill, in about 1836, where she lived for some time. The cottage was situated on the shores of the Lancove River and it is now known as Fig Tree House. On her retirement, she built a house at Newtown in Sydney, where she lived until her death from pneumonia on the 30th of May, 1855, aged 78. She outlived five of her seven children. She was buried at the Sand Hill Cemetery, which was then moved to a cemetery at La Perouse. A memorial for Reby is in the Pioneer Memorial Park in Botany Cemetery. Her will specified that funds should be reserved for the maintenance and education and advancement in life of both her male and female grandchildren. And on the $20 note with the image of Mary Reby, it is based on a miniature portrait that's painted in watercolour on ivory. It was intended as a family keepsake rather than a public painting and it portrays Reby in indoor attire with a muslin cap of fine embroidery. Also represented on the banknote was an image of the schooner Mercury that was one of the schooners that Thomas Reby and Edward Wills went into partnership and purchased for trading in the Pacific Islands, and also is the premises in George Street, Sydney, that was once owned by Thomas, and it's illustrated by drawing from Joseph Fowles in Sydney in 1848. On the corner of Argyle and Playfair Streets, on the side of the Legacy Fountain in the Rocks, there is a memorial for Mary Reby, and it says, Mary Reby, 1777 to 1855. When only 13, Mary Reby was transported to New South Wales for a prank involving horse stealing in 1794. She married Thomas Reby, who became a successful businessman. On his death in 1811, Mary was left with seven children and many business interests, Her perseverance and enterprise brought her renown in the colony and success in business and shipping, which she managed from a warehouse at 12 George Street, The Rocks. Church education and works of charity occupied her in later years. This memorial stands before the east store of the Argyle Stores Complex, which embraces the partially constructed residence and office, which she owned during 1828. So what became of Mary's children? Well, the Rebis had seven children, Thomas, James, George, Celia, Eliza, Jane and Elizabeth. All of the children were baptised at the Old St Philip's Church, Sydney, and all were well educated. Thomas and Mary Reby's three sons founded the Tasmanian branch of the family and all followed their parents' lead in mercantile and shipping ventures. The eldest son, Thomas Haydock Reby, was born on the 6th of May, 1796, He went to sea with his father and in November 1822 became a partner with his brother as a general merchant and commission agent in Launceston, trading under the name of Thomas Reby & Co. He married Ricarda Allen on the 28th of May 1817 at St Philip's, Sydney. And the marriage notice in the paper says, Marriages for St Philip's, Sydney. Thomas Reby, Master Mariner, to Ricarda Allen, youngest daughter of Mrs Collicoat, by special licence on the 28th of May 1817 by William Cowper in the presence of Thomas Collicote and Mary Collicote. 
Ricarda's mother married Thomas Collicoat in England in December 1897, a year after the death of Ricarda's father, Dr Richard Allen, a pharmacist. The marriage occurred in Sussex, England in 1806 when Ricarda was eight years old. Thomas Collicoat had leased a building off Richard Allen and ran a medicinal warehouse. He was arrested at Pill near Bristol on the 15th of January 1812 and charged with attaching forged duty stamps to bottles of medicine. At the time, the government taxed medicines by requiring the seller to buy duty stamps to stick on each bottle to be sold, thereby raising revenue. In the Times, London, under Police, Bow Street, 19th of December, 1811. Forged stamps. It has been for some time suspected by the commissioners of the stamp office that forged stamps are in circulation, particularly on patent and quack medicines. With a view to discovering the truth of this suspicion, Mr France, the solicitor to the stamps office, called at a medicine shop near the Royal Exchange and purchased a bottle of Dr Jeb's pills. On examining the stamp on the box, he discovered it to be a forgery. He inquired of the woman where she got the stamp. She replied that she had it with a number of other boxes of the same kind of pills of Mr. Collicoat, who had kept a medicine shop. Mr. France obtained a warrant to search Mr. Collicoat's house and apprehend him. Vickery went to execute the warrant. He was informed by Mrs. Collicoat that her husband was out of town. He told her he had a warrant to search for forged stamps. A servant girl accompanied him into a back room and into other parts to search for them. It then became rather dark. He requested to have a candle. The girl went downstairs to get him one. She was absent about five minutes and returned without a candle, but asked her mistress whether she should get a light. This being an unexpected circumstance, together with her not having an apron on that she'd had on when she went up for the candle, Mrs C, having given her sanction to get a light, Vickery followed her, suspecting there was something wrong with their conduct. The officer went into a back shop and descended by a ladder from over against the wall of that shop, but could not find anything there of a suspicious nature. He then went down the stairs and in a closet in the front area where coals were kept, he found a large quantity of forged stamps tied up in the apron which the servant girl had on when he first entered the house. In consequence of this discovery, he had no doubt, but when she first went downstairs, under the pretense of getting a lighted candle, that she concealed the forged stamps in the coal cellar, and in consequence took her into custody. She was, however, not detained long. It being ascertained that Mr Collicote was travelling on his business about Bath and Bristol, Vickery and Lavender were dispatched to apprehend him. They found him at Pill, near Bristol, at a public house, On searching his luggage, they found two bottles of lotion with forged stamps of the same description of those found in the house. He offered the officers a fee to destroy them, which they refused. The officers brought him into town. In the Times, London, on the 24th of February, 1812, under the Old Bailey. Thomas Collicott, who was tried last session on an indictment for forging and vending, knowing to be forged certain counterfeit stamps for patent medicines, was found guilty and sentenced to death. Mary Collicott went to see the Duke of Kent, Edward Augustus Hanover, brother of George IV and William IV, who had known her first husband, and through the Duke's intervention, his sentence was commuted to transportation for life to New South Wales. He spent a year awaiting transportation. Collicott sailed from Deptford via Madeira on the 2nd of June 1813 on the Earl Spencer, arriving at Port Jackson on the 9th of October 1813 after 129 days at sea. There was a detachment of the 73rd Regiment also on board. Thankfully, Collicott, being an educated literate man, was treated well in New South Wales, not confined in a prison but employed as a clerk. Collicott received his ticket of leave less than a year after he arrived on the 8th of August 1814. Mary and the children arrived on the 30th of January 1816 on the Mary Ann to join her husband with her children and Thomas's children. Thomas and Mary both ran the female orphan school in Parramatta from the 30th of November 1818. Three weeks after his marriage to Ricarda Allen in 1817, Thomas took his bride to Van Diemen's Land on the family's ship Governor Macquarie. On the 24th of October 1817, Thomas Jr. was granted 400 acres at Carrick, which he called Entilly House, eight miles from Launceston, and extended into the present town of Carrick. 
and Tally came with provisions from the government stores and convict labour. The estate grew cereal crops and raised Devon cattle. In November 1822, Thomas Reby went into partnership with his brother James as Thomas Reby Company General Merchants and Commission Agents of Launceston. They prospered and by November 1824 owned at least one ship, the John Bull, on which Thomas sailed as the master. Thomas died at his estate in Tally had spent near Launceston on the 3rd of October 1842. And the obituary states, On the morning of the 8th of October, he was conversing with Mr M. Chitty of Launceston and remarked that he was never in better health. Immediately upon leaving Mr Chitty and retiring to another room, the lamented gentleman fell down in an apoplectic fit. Medical assistance was summoned, but without avail, he continued insensible until 11 o'clock when he expired. Mr Reby was endeared to a large circle of friends and highly respected by all who knew him, liberal in his views, affable in his demeanour and bountiful in his contributions for the promotion of good. There are few whose loss could be more extensively felt or more sincerely deplored. They had four children, three of whom survived infancy, Mary, Thomas and James, Thomas and James were both educated at Trinity College in Oxford, England. Upon Thomas's death, the property passed to his eldest son, Thomas Haydock Reby III. He'd stayed on in England and married there, but returned in 1842 after his father's death. Thomas III became the first native Tasmanian ordained to holy orders in 1844 and was appointed to Archdeacon in 1858. On a return trip to England in 1853, he received an honorary MA from the Archbishop of Canterbury. In 1860, his estate consisted of a chapel, a conservatory, stables, a stone barn, a coach house, coachman's lodge, gatehouse, and to the north of the estate, a cricket ground. In 1868, Thomas III was subject to scandal when he was accused of diverting a lady's affection and he had to resign from the church. A court case followed shortly after in which he sued Mr Blomfield for libel. Thomas III, after a period as a recluse, stepped back into the public domain and ran for a seat in Parliament. He was elected to the House of Assembly in 1872 and for 30 years he served the people during this time. He became Colonel Secretary, Speaker of the House and eventually Premier of Tasmania from 1876 to 1877. Thomas III passed away in 1912 with no heir to the estate of the property that was passed down and it was given to Thomas Reby Gardner Arthur, the son of his sister Mary. James stayed in England after his education for the remainder of his life. The second son of Thomas and Mary Reby was James Haydock Reby. He was born on the 2nd of October 1798. He was apprenticed in 1809 to John Campbell Burton, a merchant and agent from Bengal. He married Rebecca Breeden, née Devine, in Hobart, Tasmania, on the 25th of March, 1816, and there were no children from this marriage. Rebecca's parents were Thomas Devine and Anne Doyle. Thomas Devine came out on the First Fleet, and Anne Doyle on the Lady Juliana in June 1789. Rebecca was born on Norfolk Island in May 1794, and she was four years older than James. Rebecca had previously married Joseph Breeden when she was 16 in Hobart in June 1810 and her husband died only two years after their marriage in 1812. James Haydock Reby followed his parents in successful trade and business. Like his father, he was a sailor and he never settled down to the quiet life on shore. In November 1822, James went into partnership with his brother Thomas, as mentioned before, under the company Thomas Reby & Co, General Merchants and Commission Agents of Launceston. They did prosper and bought their ship, the John Bull, and they engaged in sealing and other coastal shipping activities. One of the ships was the schooner Het, which operated between Hobart and Sydney in the 1820s. After 1822, James and his wife moved from Hobart to Launceston, in 1825, James and his brother-in-law, John Atkinson, owned the Cutter Eclipse, which had been used in the sealing industry in Tasmania. It was fitted out with superior accommodation and it sailed between Port Dalrymple and Sydney. He was one of the first directors of the Derwent and Cornwall Banks in Van Diemen's Land in 1828. James died on the 11th of September 1843 at his home in William Street, Launceston. James Haydock and his wife, Rebecca, were both buried at the Cypress Street Cemetery in Newstead, Launceston. 
The cemetery closed in 1906 and the land was reclaimed by the Anglican Church for use by Launceston Church Grammar School. In 1953, the headstone was taken to Antilly House at Hadspen. The headstone is displayed against a brick wall at the rear of Antilly House just outside the chapel. The third child of Mary and Thomas Reby was George Haydock Reby, born on the 2nd of February 1801 in Sydney. He never married and was killed in an accident at the home of his brother, Thomas, at Antilly House in Hadspen on the 26th of October 1823. There are a few small snippets into George's life before his death. He was convicted of assault on Henry Brooks in June 1819 and his mother paid the fine. George had been an assistant cashier at the Bank of New South Wales from February 1820 to February 1821, but was dispensed with an economy measure by the bank. The cashier had misappropriated a large sum of money and it was felt that George may have been unfairly dismissed at that time. A friend, George Allen, wrote in his diary on the 29th of November 1823, A few days ago, the very melancholy intelligence of the death of my beloved friend, Mr. George Reby, reached my ears. It certainly did not surprise me because I had expected it for some time ago, having been aware of the dreadful misfortune which soon deprived him of his life. He was about my own age, possessing good talents, amiable in his disposition, warm in his affection, and rather lofty in his ideals. But alas, he was gone. And his obituary in the Sydney Gazette on the 27th of November 1823. On the 26th, at Intelli, the residence of Mr Thomas Reby, Launceston, Port Dalrymple. Mr George Reby, aged 23. This truly excellent young gentleman met with death prematurely. He resided on his farm some miles distant from town. One day he went into the woods with the intention of hunting. He had occasion to ascend a tree and when some height... The branch that momentarily sustained him broke off and Mr. Reby fell on his back, encountering the stump of a tree in the fall. For a considerable time he was senseless, and when he recovered from the violence of the fall, it was only to discover that he was in an injured and weakened state and destitute of the assistance of a domestic or the sympathy of a friend. Providence, however, afforded him strength to reach his residence and intelligence was instantly sent off to Launceston of the unfortunate circumstance. Three surgeons attended Mr. Reby, but an inflammation having commenced, it was found impossible to impede his fatal progress. He lived to learn the lamented death of a beloved sister, and in a few days after her death, he followed Mrs. Wills into the world of spirits. Those who were acquainted with Mr. Reby are best enabled to estimate his worth. It is often the case that many, when no more, are exalted for virtues they never possessed, but this cannot be alleged in the present lamentable instance. The many virtues of the deceased shone conspicuously forth in numberless instances, and he possessed a mind well stored with intellectual attainments. His pursuits were of a literary turn, were calculated to constitute him an useful and honourable member of both these interesting colonies. In Mr. Reby, therefore, a deprivation is experienced both public and private. In Hobart Town, he was the first that actively coalesced with the Reverend Mr. Horton, Wesleyan Ministry, about two years since, in procuring subscriptions and donations towards the erection of the Wesleyan Chapel in progress in that colony. So, as was just alluded to in George's death, the fourth child of Mary and Thomas Reby, Celia Reby, was born on the 1st of February 1803 in Sydney, and she was mentioned in a lot more detail in bonus episode number eight with Edward Wills and his family, as she married Thomas Wills, one of Edward Wills' children, on the 18th of June, 1822, at St Philip's Church, Sydney, when Celia was 19. Celia died on the 28th of September, 1823, aged only 20. It's at the residence of her mother in George Street, Sydney, after an indisposition of some few months, Mrs Wills in her 21st year. The amiable young lady was the eldest daughter of Mrs Reby. In June 1822, she was in, united with two Mr Thomas Wills, to whom she bequeathed a pledge of tenderest affection, a sweet little girl. Shortly prior to her confinement, about four months since, Mrs Wills caught a violent cold, which fastened on the lungs and originated a rapid consumption. To delineate the grief of the astonished widower, a young father, is a task to which our pen is quite incompetent. Her son is gone down while it was yet day. They had one child, Alice Wills, who was born on the 6th of July, 1823. 
months, only a few months before her mother's death. And then she died on the 11th of April, 1824, aged only 11 months and five days. So poor Thomas had the loss of his wife and his baby child as well. The fifth child of Thomas and Mary Reby was Eliza. She was born in 1805 in Sydney. She departed Sydney on the 18th of March, 1817. And she married Lieutenant Thomas Thompson of the Royal Marines 46th Regiment, who was Scottish, on the 20th of November, 1821 in Hobart, when she was 16 and Thomas 27. Lieutenant Thomas Thompson was commandant and and magistrate of the settlement of Newcastle in New South Wales from 1814 to 1816. Much of Lieutenant Thompson's time in Newcastle seems to have been taken up with a despatch of vital supplies of lime, coal and timber to Sydney and in controlling the convict population of which there was a steady stream in and out of that settlement. Lieutenant Thompson was more lenient than other commandments as he allowed the practice of prisoners to work on their own behalf. Lieutenant Thompson's two years in Newcastle resulted in a worthwhile outcome for the settlement as it was under his direction that a school was established at Newcastle with convict Henry Rensford employed as schoolmaster. Captain Thompson and his detachment departed on the HMS Lady Nelson on the 30th of June 1816. Eighty years later, he was described by Newcastle historian H.W.H. Huntington. He was a man of plain, sound understanding and acted upon his own conviction with sincerity. The law of benevolence and kindness was written too deeply on his heart to make him an oppressive discipline, and his courteous, conciliating and polished manners ill accorded with the uncouth manners of the class of persons located at Newcastle at the time. Thomas Thompson was appointed captain on the 7th of September 1815 and he departed from the colony with his regiment on the Dick in October 1817 bound for Madras. He was appointed major on the 21st of June 1831. Eliza and Captain Thompson had eight children together and Eliza died aged 65 at their property Oakburn at Launceston. The sixth child, Jane Penelope, was born on the 14th of December 1807 in Sydney. She married John Atkinson on the 6th of September 1824 in Sydney and in the Sydney Gazette on the 18th of September 1824. Married on Saturday last by Reverend William Cowper, Senior Assistant Chaplain at St Philip's Church, Charlotte Place, by special licence, John Atkinson Esquire of the firm Atkinson and Bingle, to Miss Jane Penelope, third daughter of Mrs. Reby of Macquarie Place. John Atkinson was born in London in 1795. He was 12 years older than Jane. John's father was a master mariner and he arrived in Hobart Town in 1817 but was removed to Sydney in 1819. Mary Reby built a house for Penelope and John called Reby Croft and the original grant was out of 200 acres that was given to Thomas Reby. John and Jane Atkinson had four sons and seven daughters and Jane died on the 9th of October 1854 in Launceston. And the youngest child born to Thomas and Mary Reby, Elizabeth Ann, was born on the 8th of March 1810 in Sydney. She married Captain Joseph Long Innes, a lieutenant of Her Majesty's 39th Regiment at St James's in Sydney on the 5th of May 1829. Captain Innes was born on the 19th of November 1806 at County Leitrim, Ireland. He resigned his commission to stay in Sydney when his regiment departed in 1832. In 1837, he was granted the title of captain. In November 1839, he was appointed superintendent of police of Sydney and his new role earned him a salary of £400 per annum. Elizabeth Ann's mother Mary also built a home for Elizabeth and Joseph. It was called Stanmore House. It was on Enmore Road, Enmore, and it was built around 1850. Elizabeth and Joseph had seven children. One son, Sir Joseph George Long Innes, was a judge of the New South Wales Supreme Court, and his son, Reginald Heath Innes, became Chief Judge in Equity of the New South Wales Supreme Court. Elizabeth died about 1876 in Paddington, London, England, aged 66, and she's buried at the Kensal Green Cemetery, Kensington, Middlesex. Mary Reby's children produced 25 grandchildren, and many of them would go on to have successful lives. 
As you can recall in Mary's will, she insisted that her grandchildren be educated in England and indeed both sons of her firstborn Thomas, Thomas and James, were educated at Eton and Oxford in the 1870s. Mary Reby was a persevering and enterprising woman in everything that she undertook and she became legendary in the colony as a successful businesswoman. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.